Hey, listen, Hello? Uh, give your attention, please. I got somebody online here. So we're going to go ahead uh, and get started. We know we still have some people in line, but that's fine. I, I want to go ahead and get this started. So let's uh, start off with a word of prayer. We we'll thank the Lord for what we have. Father, we thank you now that uh, you provided for us the, the food on our plates and um, a place of employment, a place, Lord, that we can meet and uh, discuss your word. We pray, Father, for your truth today to um, to work through us as the word, as your scripture says, is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. We pray that you will pierce us to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. Teach us your ways. And lead us in the way everlasting. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. So last time. Oh, uh, I just wanted to show you this real quick. Someone had asked me. Uh, I told them we're having a barbecue this time. Someone had asked me if uh, there's going to be something for vegetarians. And I said, well, I don't know. I, I looked at this verse here in uh, Romans 14, which says, one person has faith that he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats vegetables only. No, so I, I thought that was pretty good there. So. <laughs> How about that, huh? Didn't know that was in the Bible, did you? Now? <laughs> you know, you could twist scripture to say anything you want. You know, so. Okay, so um, last week, we saw attempts to trap Jesus. Uh, the, this one with particular one was about the woman taken in adultery. Uh, the, our law says we sh she should be stoned. What do you say? They're trying to trap him. Of course, uh, Job 5.13, the scripture says, He captures the wise by their own shrewdness, and the, the advice of the cunning is quickly thwarted. So they always backfire when you, they try to trap Jesus. Remember when he asked, they asked them, should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? Remember what he said? Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, give to God what is God's. I mean, you're not going to trap them. I mean, he's going to turn it back. In fact, the whole book of John, at least the first 12 chapters, and especially the last part, was a, is really a, um, a, a montage of stories of where the religious leaders were trying to trap Jesus and um, were try, were actually had him on, thought they had, were bringing him to trial when the whole time that they were the actual ones who were on trial because Jesus would always turn it back on them. And also, so the, and then the woman, we ended up the woman taken in adultery where Jesus says, where are your accusers? She said, there are none. And he said, neither do I accuse you. Go and sin no more. And so there must be conviction before there can be conversion, which is, by the way, like why most books of, that Paul wrote, especially the book of Romans, you show the bad stuff first because you have to know where you came from and what your condition is before you can accept what God has for you. And so our condition and his provision. And so the first three chapters of Romans paints a bleak picture, right, of who we are. It's almost like if you go to a jewelry store and they bring out uh, a gem. And what do they do? If it's a light color gem, they'll bring it out on a black background. If it's a black color gem, they'll bring it out on a light color background because they want to accentuate the gem. And that's what Romans does is accentuates our sin. The first three chapters, it says this is who you are, where you come from. And you're in desperate need. And then here is the provision by God, chapters 4 through 6. Uh, it's justification by faith and sanctification by the Spirit. And so, uh, so the woman taken in adultery, she was convicted, but then she, she repented. And, and Jesus said, go and sin no more. Now the religious leaders, of course, thought they were righteous, that they were keeping the law, that they needed no help from Jesus. So they... He, even if he offered it to them, they wouldn't accept it because they didn't need it. It's like a, you know, it's like trying to get me to go to the doctor today. I don't need to go to the doctor. I feel just fine, right? If you feel like you're righteous and don't need help from God, you're not going to come to come to Him. So without, so again, I said this before. But, uh, when it comes to, um, let's see, without God, when it comes to God. Without Him, we can't. But without us, He won't. See the difference there now. So we're picking up now in uh, John 8, 21. And um, let's see, 8, 21. And Jesus is going to talk about how he's the light. He's going to start this uh, motif of light here. Yeah. Jesus said to him again, I am going away. So he, he talks a little bit about uh, 
Well, let me back up just a little bit because um, I'll pick it up in verse 12. Jesus spoke to them again. This is after the woman taken in adultery. I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. The Pharisees therefore said to him, you bear witness of yourself. Your witness is not true. Uh, because according to Pharisee, according to, to the Torah, the law, you had, there had to be two people um, in, order for, in order for it to pass legal muster, there had to be two people to, to support the accusation against or the um, to witness. But they said, you, it's just you. Jesus answered and said to them, even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true, for I know where I came from and where I'm going. But you do not know where I come from and where I'm going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. Remember what First uh, Samuel 16, 7 says? Um, when uh, Samuel was looking for the next king, and he came to the house of Jesse, and all seven brothers were there, all six brothers were there, and Jesse, one by one, and God said, no, it's not him, it's not him. And uh, Samuel said, do you have any other brothers here? Well, yeah, the youngest one's out there tending the sheep. That was the job of the youngest brother to tend the sheep, because that was, nobody wanted to do that job. You had to, you had to sleep with him and, and all that. So David came up, and, and, and that's when he was anointed, and God told Samuel, look not on a, on a person's outward appearance, because man... Uh, man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart, you see. So he can see down deeper. And that's why Jesus says, um, you judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. Now, he says, I judge no one. That's strange. Isn't he supposed to be the judge of everything? I think I take this to mean this. Number one, he's not judging like them in a, in a uh, condemna in condemnation. But, uh, in fact, you know, when... when uh, in, uh, Matthew 7, when Jesus says, judge not lest you be judged. Remember that? Everyone, even if you're not a Christian, you know that verse, right? I mean, well, everyone knows that one. Five verses later, Jesus says, do not cast your holy things before dogs or precious things before swine. So obviously, you got now you got a problem here because you got to judge who people are, right? So you don't cast your best before them. Um, you know, those those types. So I think the difference is a judgment of condemnation. And, an, and another uh, a judgment is where you're dis discerning people, who they are, who you should hang around, and who you should not be hanging around. There's a difference there. Condemnation. And Jesus is going to come. And, he said, though, this time he came not to judge the world, but to save. This is his first advent, the first time Jesus comes. The second time he comes, he's going to come as judge. So it's a difference between the lion and the lamb. He came as a lamb the first time. He's coming as a lion the second time. You see, so there, there is a, he will come as judge. But, uh, the next time he comes, you won't recognize him according to the gospels. He's not going to be like that gentle shepherd that you see in the gospels. He's going to be the Jesus of the Revelation. And I, that's a that's a that's a serious type of Jesus in that one. Now uh, he'll he'll still be the same God, but he has a different uh, a different role at that time. And so he goes on to say, and yet, if I do judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone, but I am with the Father who sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one who bears witness of myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness of me. They said to him, where is your father? Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. Um, these words Jesus spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no one laid hands on him, for his hour had not yet come. Where did I tell you the treasury was in the temple? Anybody remember? I pointed that out to you up here. It's in the court of women. That's right, the court of women. So that would be the first court you come to when you come in the temple. Actually, the first court is the court of the Gentiles. The second court is the court of Jewish women. So there he is. No one laid hands on him, for his hour had not yet come. Then Jesus said to them again, I am going away. And you will seek me and will die in your sin. When I go, you cannot come. When I go, you cannot come. This is the transcendence and the imminence of God. He's going to, he's going to go to a place that they can't go. So that, that's his transcendence. In other words, it transcends this world. He's in some other um, place that we cannot come. But at the same time, he's imminent. Imminent means with us. So he's with us and at the same time apart. And this is... And, and um, let me show you this here. So the, the uh, eminence, Matthew 28, 20, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Remember he said that in Matthew 28. Let me show you this chart. 
So here's the difference here. So you can wrap your mind about worldviews. There was a book written uh, not too long ago by Peter Kreeft, which is a, he's an apologist, Christian apologist. And he wrote a book, and uh, you may not know this, but does anybody else know who else died uh, the same day as John F. Kennedy, November 22nd, 62, right? No, November 22nd, 63. Is that right? Okay. You know who else died that day? C.S. Lewis and Aldous Huxley. Now, of course, when someone like John F. Kennedy dies, he's, he's going to overshadow anyone else who dies on that day, so you probably would not have known that. A guy named Peter Kreef wrote a book about uh, John F. Kennedy, C.S. Lewis, and Aldous Huxley, uh, and it's a, it's a um, fiction, and they're all in a waiting room. Uh, between heaven and hell, and um, and they have a discussion. So I can't remember the name of the book. I'll try to remember next time, but it's a strange discussion because they all three represent the three major worldviews. John F. Kennedy, though he was a Catholic, he was really a humanist um, deep down. Um, C.S. Lewis was a theist, of course. At first he was an atheist, and he, he read uh, um, Chesterton, G.K. Chesterton, kind of became a Christian. And then uh, Aldous Huxley was a... Uh, um, oh gosh, how do I? Well, he's a, he was a natural. Uh, no, he was a spiritualist. So here's the three major worldviews: theism, monism, and naturalism. Remember when we finished our last session? Jesus, it said that he was with the woman alone. You remember that? It was just them two, because God, Jesus, God can reduce his world to one person. He can reduce it to you. Isn't that wonderful? That you can have the I-thou relationship. In fact, think about this. The only way you're going to have a God of love is if that God uh, was made up of more than one person. Because if it was just one person and one God, there can be no love. It would be love of self, which is basically narcissism. But if you have one God and three persons, now you can have love flowing between the Father and the Son and the Spirit. You see what I'm saying here? That's really the only way. Trini Trini the Trinity is the only way you're going to have a loving God. I know It may be a little hard to wrap the mind around, but see, but see, He can get personal with you. God can get personal with you. He can be imminent right here with you, and, and at the same time, He can be somewhere uh, where you are not. Um, the origin would be a personal creator, of course. God created us. The purpose would be to have relationships, which is other-centered. You see, in, in hell, you are self-centered. And in fact, um, Augustine, Augustine said we are curved inward on ourselves. We're all about ourselves. And so left to our own desires, we would be, we'd be wrapped up all in ourselves. That's what hell is. You ever heard that expression, I would rather rule, uh, rule in hell than serve in heaven? You're not going to rule in hell because no one's going to be under your rule. They're all going to be under their own rule. And they're all going to be so self-centered. There will be no relationships in hell. You realize this, right? There are no relationships in hell. It's just you. And there is no God. And there is no hope. But see, but, but with God, it's, it's all about, it's other-centered. Can you imagine if you were coming through the gate this morning... And everybody just parted to the side and let you just come right on through the gate. You have to wait. This is what heaven is like. What everyone's thinking about you. That's basically other-centered. And then finally, what's your destiny? An unbound relational life. We all in here, if we're all believers, and I'm assuming we are, and I'm not, I'm not that naive to believe there may, not, there may be one person who's not, but hopefully we all are. We can all meet sometime, all of us can meet sometime in heaven a thousand years from now and talk about this one day and we can reminisce on this one day. All of us can. Because no two believers will ever, no two believers will ever meet for the last time. How about that, huh? No two believers will ever meet for the last time. Then you go to monism, which is uh, all is one, all is God. In fact, I can... I can summarize every New Age book in six steps. They're all the same. It's monotonous. It's boring. Here they are. All is one. All is God. Therefore, you're God. But you don't know you're God. You have a of helping you understand the God that is within you. 
And number six is when enough people realize this and we reach critical mass, we'll move into the next stage of, of uh, cosmic evolution. So you see that that's basically what monism is. Everything is one and all is God. Um, and there's different elements like there's pantheism, which says that everything is God, or God is, is everything. There's panentheism, which says God is in everything, when God is in that chair right there. Um, and there are other forms of this, but it's basically, it's an impersonal agency. Why would you want to believe in a God, but not to believe in a personal God? Just some kind of impersonal agent. Why would you, why would you want to do that? Think about it. You can control it. You can control it? That's true. And the other thing is this. You don't have to answer to an impersonal God. You have to, you have to answer to this God right here. You actually have to give an account of, of everything you've done. Really, you have to give an account of all your, your life to this guy. Of course, now, uh, when, when you know he came, he put himself on the cross, sacrificed himself on our behalf so he could take <coughs> our sin. With it. So you don't want to deal with that. It's okay to believe in God, just don't make it personal. Because now, there are some things that are wrong and some things that are right. And people don't like that, do they? No, they don't like that. Um, it's all about self-actualization. Remember that pyramid, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and at the top is self-actualization. What did Jesus say? If you want to be my disciple, you must deny yourself. So it's self-denial with theism. Self-denial, but it's self-actualization. And then finally, you're absorbed into the, the whole spirit world. You lo actually lose your personality. You are no longer Sherry Fields. You are a part of this gigantic, this one God. That's, see, there's, so there is no relationship here because it's all one. It's different than in theism. You keep your personality. You are Fred and Bob and Valerie for the rest, for eternity, and have that relationship with God between you and him. And then finally, there's a naturalism or materialism or humanism. It's called different things. It's basically the origin is the impersonal plus time plus chance he gave us everything we have here. Um, what is the purpose? It's just to survive. What is the book by uh, Richard Dawkins, the, uh, um, the Selfish Gene, right? And all the gene wants to do is just replicate itself into something, into someone else, and just survive. And uh, finally, what's your destiny? Annihilation. And you are no more. At the end of this life, that's it. There is no more. So um, those are the three basic worldviews. I brought that up because of Jesus's personal touch with the woman taken in adultery and how that touches me and I bet it touches you the powerful image of the God of creation stopping everything stopping time and spending time with this one person who really needed him and that's the kind of God you want to serve right there is interested in her spiritual growth almost done so um <clears throat> I think we're not going to go much. For so I'll go look on another couple slides. Okay, that right here. So uh, these words spoke Jesus. And Jesus said to them, I'm going away. Okay. The Jews said, will he kill himself? Because he says, where I go, you cannot go. And he said to them, you are from beneath. I am from above. You are from this world. I am not of this world. And I'll read the next uh Therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins, for if you do not believe that I am. Now, in your Bible, some of your Bibles, it'll have the word he. I am he. It's, there is no he in that verse. Actually, it's ego ami, I am. I've told you a number of times when Jesus says I am, he's referring to Exodus 3.14, Jehovah God. He says, unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. That's what he said right here. So, um, and I'll finish with this one. Colossians, he says, I am from above, you are from the earth. Colossians 3, 2, seek that which is from above. If you, bathe, if you allow the culture of this world to bathe your mind on a regular basis, and remember how culture indoctrinates and teaches you through the media, uh, through education, and through entertainment, those three ways. And that's how, if you allow your mind to be bathed by what you see on the news every day, the movies, some of the movies that are shown in, in the university, 
it's amazing how at the university level you, they seem to they seem to lose common sense. Because no, I'm not, I kid you not. not and all, almost all of us in here are products of a university somewhere. But I'm just saying, at the university level, if I was to ask a six-year-old child, when Jesus says, "I am the way, the truth, and the life; no person comes to the Father but by me," and then ask that child, "How many ways are there to the Father?" The child's going to say one. Now, if I was to ask, go to the university campus and ask that question. Oh, well, that Jesus is the way, but there are plenty of other ways, too. You see, you somehow you lose your common sense when this happens. See, so uh, you seek that which is from above. You want to allow the, the, this word to bathe your mind on a regular basis. And it gives you the peace that, that cannot come from this world. Isaiah 55, 9, my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. For as the heavens are higher than the earth. So are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Philippians 3.20, our, our citizenship is in heaven. Now, you've never been there before. You don't remember it. You have no memory of this. But your, your home is actually in heaven if you are a believer. This is not your home. You are a stranger and a pilgrim down here. And the closer you come in, in congruence with this word right here, the less you're going to look like the world. And the world's not going to like you. And then uh, finally, uh, on the great high priestly prayer of John 17, where Jesus says he's praying to the Father, and he said, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world. He's talking about you. Even as I am not of the world, I do not ask you to take them out of the world. So Jesus is asking the Father, leave them here, because we have a mission for them here. But keep them from the evil one. But while they're here, protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. You see, this is a different world. You are currently in a different place, a place where you're not, this is not your destiny. Your destiny is with, with him and another world for eternity. But he has us here for a certain time, for a certain purpose. For some people, they're only here seven hours and they fulfill their purpose for some people seven days and they fulfill their purpose for some people 70 years until they fulfill their purpose but God has a purpose for everybody here and when, when he's done with you as, as, as someone once said you are indestructible until God is finished with you how about that you are indestructible until God is finished with you so having said that um, now next week uh, we'll pick up, you know, where we're not, but I won't be here next week. So we're not going to do this. Um, that's next. Yeah, we're not going to do this, but um, we'll pick it up in two weeks then, okay? Why don't you guys go? Do we have food left over? So if you want to take something home, I think you can there. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you that you've demonstrated through your word, Lord, how so important it is to bathe our mind on your truth from your word so that we will not be taken in by the culture of this world or help us to walk with you on a daily basis, to take this, to use where we work here at AMC and the Army, Lord, to turn over to, turn over to you, Lord, the best possible uh, sacrifice that we can today that will be pleasing in your sight. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs> I saw you walk in. I thought you were just laying in the I just got out of the room. Oh, okay. It's okay. We got to hear the next part of it. I said, I'll take you for one. Yeah, I'm going to find you. You're right, though. I told you. I need to talk later, man. You know, I said, don't bless the next one. I'm going to tell you next one.